this is Robert Mixa from the Word on Fire Institute. Um, I am the Fellow of Education, and I'm here with Dr. Reinhard Hüter, the Ordinary Professor of Fundamental and Dogmatic Theology at Catholic University of America. Uh, Dr. Reinhard Hüter is a native of Germany. Uh, he received his education um, in universities in Germany and also at Duke University. Uh, Dr. Reinhardt has been at CUA for the last couple of years, but previously he was at Duke University. Um, Dr. Reinhardt is a convert to the Catholic Church, and he's also an expert in, in Car uh, John Henry Newman's thought and especially Thomas Aquinas, and he does a great job of bringing the two of them together. And that's why I wanted to have Dr. Uh, Hooter on today to talk about John Henry Newman, because oftentimes John Henry Newman is not oftentimes interpreted in light of Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas is such a systematic theologian, so it's always good to kind of read a theologian in the light of Aquinas. Um, so I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Hooter. Thank you. Uh, it's great to uh, be here and be available for you and uh, able to speak on, 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 on your on your show. Yes, it's great to have you. Uh, so just to kind of start, um, New, uh, St. John Henry Newman um, is such a, a pivotal player in the Catholic Church. John Henry, uh, John Tracy Ellis said that he's perhaps the greatest Catholic theologian since Thomas Aquinas. And so I just wanted to ask you, as a native of Germany, how did you first learn about John Henry Newman? And what was your initial impression of him? It was late. It was late. I should tell you, among German Lutherans, uh, uh, Newman is a, a theological nobody. Uh, no one reads him, no one knows him, and the few people who might hear about him will, will hold a certain attitude of suspicion in relationship to him because, because he's after all a convert. Mm -hmm. He left the Protestant cause behind. And so in my many years of studies of theology and philosophy in Germany, I actually didn't encounter him at all. It was during my first teaching assignment as a Lutheran moral theologian and systematic theologian in Chicago, where I taught at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. And I was in my third, this we're talking now the year 1993, 94. I was in my third or fourth year of teaching there and was working on my second major book. In German, it's called the Habilitation. It's the second doctorate. Uh, and I was working on the relationship of theology and the church. Hmm. And during that time, the question of Catholicism had come up as I was working on that. And two persons whom I respected highly, two Lutherans, had uh, converted to the Catholic faith uh, in nine, about 93. And one of them was uh, John Richard Newhouse. Hmm. The other one was his close friend, uh, Robert Wilken. Hmm. The patristic theologian, yes, to whom yes. I was closer than to Newhouse. Hmm. And especially Robert Wilkins' conversion uh, worked on me, uh, uh, had an impact on me. We had a correspondence. Um, and I had questions of my own during that time of a theological nature. Um, and it, it was at that time uh, that I founded a used bookstore. Chicago has wonderful used bookstores in Hyde Park. I know. Yeah, I, I know. Found a, beautiful old copy of the Apologia Pro Vita Sua. Hmm. And by that time I had heard some things about Newman and I knew this was his famous autobiographical work. So I bought it and uh, read it in the following weeks. And I must say two things. For one, at that time being only in my third or fourth year in the United States and still a, a beginner uh, in the English language, the style was somewhat challenging for me, the Victorian style. Now I'm very used to it and I love it. But at that time, I remember it, 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 it was OK, but it was an uphill battle. So I can relate to people who say, oh, I opened some Newman and boy, this Victorian English was actually a bit off putting for me. <laughs> some people really don't like his style. I have become a lover of his style, but mm. this is now many years later. <laughs> the content of the book struck me right to the heart, I must say, um, to that degree that I could not integrate Newman into my own writings at that time. Um, I had to repress him in my memory. Mm. 
I, I read the book, uh, and and then I had to, in a way, forget about it. How how long did you forget about it? Uh, a number of years. Um, uh, I, I realized if I were to draw out all the implications of this reading of Newman at that time, looking down the alley, I realized that the implications would carry me way too far. I could not complete my project of a Lutheran fundamental theology, basically. Hmm. The book is in English called Suffering Divine Things. It came out. It addresses George Lindbergh, the nature of doctrine and dogma, the relationship hmm. to the church, all questions that Newman worked on. But they, uh, uh, Newman's uh, 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 challenge for me was at that moment too great. I had to put the book to the side. Mm -hmm. And after I finished my book, I came across um, a small book by Josef Ratzinger that I had, was not aware of on the relationship of theology and the church. And when I read that book, I realized first that the church Joseph Ratzinger in this book, at that time Cardinal Ratzinger, was writing about, um, was very much the church I had been reconstructing in my own project. Hmm. And everything in that Ratzinger book on theology in the church I agreed with. I was shocked. I underlined every second line, and that means I agree with it, <laughs> and made exclamation marks at the side. And after that realization, that was after the book was done, we're talking now 90. 96, 97. At that time, I realized I hadn't returned to Newman. Hmm. I had to pick up what I had repressed and began to consider Newman again. Um, it took about another, at that time, it took about another seven years. It was in 2004 that my wife and I were received. Um, and, and, uh, and it took those years to work through a whole range of theological issues that I had to do. Um, Newman did not yet become a major in the Logot at the time. It was primarily the Apologia. I had to work through issues that Newman did not directly address okay. in his writings. Um, they pertained to uh, the role and nature of the Eucharist. It pertained to moral theology. It pertained to questions of magisterial authority. There, Newman came the closest mm -hmm. for me, but other works, especially the encyclicals of John Paul II, played a major role. Um, it was then close to the point of being received into the church in, when it was 2003, 2004, very close, and then in the year after having been received, that, that I returned uh, uh, with great intensity to Newman. Um, I read Ian Carr's wonderful big biography that I recommend mm -hmm. to everyone. Uh, I, I still remember when I, I, I soaked that up. Um, and parallel to that, I began to, to read a, a range of his writings. And eventually, at Duke University, I was still teaching there after I was received for about another nine years and eventually began to teach John Henry Newman. That's um, yes, kind of in your personal biography, you also mention uh, the ethical dilemmas that you had as a Lutheran. Right. Right. Um, you said it was, you, had, you were trying to teach um, theological ethics according to revelation, natural law, and conscience, and you right. realized that all the students that were coming into your class um, already kind of had those deconstructed for them. And so uh, then you, you mentioned, too, the writings. I thought was, this was very, um, very important, uh, of the writings of John Paul II, especially his encyclical uh, Veritatis Splendor. As yeah, that had a profound impact on me, a deep impact and uh, um, a deep resonance also with his teaching of conscience there. It was quite a bit later that I realized that his unteaching on conscience is, of course, completely compatible, absolutely compatible with Newman's. Yes, and in yes. some ways, in some ways, maybe even informed by Newman, although more indirectly, the direct influence comes more from Thomas Aquinas, mm -hmm. his teaching on conscience. Now, now let's you kind of in your journey to the Catholic faith, um, being influenced by Newman. Um, how do you see, like, what's the significance of Newman today on theology? You mentioned conscience. 
but also kind of that being informed by Thomas Aquinas. So you hear today a lot of the kind of resourcement Thomism that's going, this rediscovery of Thomas. I know for one, I, I really wish I had a more robust education in St. Thomas Aquinas, um, but what contribution does, does Newman, you think, make uh, for today's theology? Uh, Newman makes a very important contribution. He is very much our contemporary. Um, in a way, maybe, that we cannot claim Thomas Aquinas to be. Um, Newman uh, was a person who stood with both feet, whether he liked it or not, in the modern world. He, he is a citizen of that world that we also still inhabit. The problems we have to face in, uh, in, in the wider society, um, in theology, philosophical strands, you name it, um, emerged during Newman's time uh, with great force, and, and we live with them uh, to a much greater exposure. But Newman, with a keen prescience, almost a prophetic sense, uh, saw the developments emerging, problematic developments, and uh, in, with a very keen sense gave us instruments of distinction, what I call in my book between truths and counterfeits that look almost the same mm -hmm. as what is true and go for the truth. This is true for, especially for conscience. This is true for the faith. We have a great confusion about the nature of the faith presently. This is true for um, the complicated question of development of doctrine Mm -hmm. And it's also true for the university, that for Newman was the place of uh, formation of the mind, uh, cultivating the intellect, and at the same time um, being a context in which our moral formation would take place. Mm -hmm. um, and in these four areas, and there might be some additional ones we could easily think of, uh, Newman uh, is uh, our contemporary in a way that he, his writings engage us and challenge us to make the right distinctions in facing uh, uh, the fundamental confusions of our day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 we don't need to talk about Thomas Aquinas now. Thomas Aquinas is a bit harder to access. I think he's in many of his thoughts and many of his insights completely compatible with Newman, though his approach is different. His approach is what we call a sapiential approach, a scientific approach that has become foreign to us harder to access for many people. Newman's approach is a personal approach. Uh, he engages his readers directly on particular points um, with uh, rhetorical force, uh, with a great subtlety of mind, but engages readers in a way that they are engaged as persons and would be able to make acts of real ascent in relationship to his sermons, to his talks to his writings um, and Thomas Aquinas had had uh, uh, overall uh, uh, another way of drawing his readers into an exercise of what we would say looking up together at the truths um, and that is an exercise people are not that used to anymore these days so the role of access is longer and harder I think in some ways to Thomas than it is to Newman mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of um, talking about the relevance of Newman for today, um, Bishop Barron oftentimes talks about um, evangelists and especially preachers mimicking Newman, especially in his use of kind of using more the Germanic words of the English language instead of the Latinate words as to kind of um, provoke one to real assent. What do you think evangelists can learn from Newman, kind of along those lines? Well, Newman had the great gift of a high awareness of his audience, to whom he was speaking, where his audience was mentally, uh, psychologically, and existentially, and what their hang-ups are, so to speak, what the obstacles mm -hmm. are uh, that would make it hard for them to embrace the truth of the gospel, the truth of the church, um, the truth of the supernatural world, the world into which God wants to draw us out of a, out of the imminent frame of materialism, for example. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that is a great gift that Newman had and a great skill. And that is something evangelists have uh, and can learn from Newman um, to be aware of our specific audiences. Now, most of his audiences were academic, so the kind of writing style um, and his rhetorical subtlety and force are very much geared to a 19th century a literate audience, highly literate mm-hmm. audience, mm-hmm. most of his writings. Um, I don't recommend that to be copied by contemporary evangelists. Okay. They would not be all too successful with that. What they should copy is Newman's attitude, namely um, his personalist approach. That is what they should emulate. Mm-hmm. Um, the personalist approach, addressing the person directly and being a spiritual, moral, and intellectual presence to the person and staying in the presence of persons and having that be a a personal influence, Mm -hmm. an influence that is not just intellectual, but also moral and spiritual, encompassing the whole person, addressing the whole person. Yes. The unity of sagacity and sanctity is something I think that Newman is an example of, sagacity, Mm -hmm. Wisdom, sanctity, uh, the uh, embodiment of a full Christian life in all of its virtues uh, and strengths. You think Uh, about um, the early martyrs as kind of the best apologia is the the witness of the martyrs um, and the kind of... It is, it is, though, Newman, we would call talk about a white martyrdom. He was not martyred. um, and so we have here uh, the tradition of the martyrdom of a person who follows the path of the truth mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. is ready to uh, uh, pay for it. And Newman uh, in his life at various points at considerably high personal cost in matters of reputation uh, and in other regards. Uh, and that is part of the strength of his witness. Mm-hmm. Uh, though, though God did not call him to the ultimate act um, of martyrdom in 19th century England, though in the 16th century some of his predecessors were called to that uh, act. Yeah, and you, you see um, kind of interpreting, especially the thought of Newman, um, you see this kind of uh, uh, happening right away in the in the nineteenth early nineteenth century, the early twentieth century, even going into Vatican II, and up to our very own day. Um, you have a certain modernist reading of Newman, which is very surprising given his Biglietto speech. Um, and then you also have, um, I mean, I don't see this as much, but what you call an antiquarian kind of view of the development of doctrine. So, uh, I mean, a lot, I see more people erring on the side of, um, of lining up Newman with what you call presentism. Um, so what I call you, presentism. Yeah. Yes. Can, can you maybe flesh that out a little bit for, for people to understand the proper well, interpretation of Newman? Right. I mean, Newman was in conversation in his day with a lot of people uh, across the spectrum, as we would call it theologically. Um, and he was in dialogue with them. As you know, he was a, a, a great man of letters, of writing letters, uh, uh, to a degree that is hard for us to imagine how he managed. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think we have 40,000 letters left of him, and uh, we must assume that that's only half of what, what there is. It's, it's hard to imagine. And so um, there were persons in the, in the church, liberal Catholics in England, Lord Acton, Baron von Hügel, Um, with whom he was in correspondence and who found aspects of his work attractive. Uh, It is very easy to read Newman selectively because he would not write systematic treatises that would cover all aspects. He would engage his audience. He would speak directly. And so that is a vulnerability of his work. And so his work on the development of doctrine especially um, was open to a reading um, is vulnerable if it's read selectively in a way and uh, in an unbalanced way. Uh, it is vulnerable to be received into what we might call um, 
the movement, broadly speaking, broadly speaking, of modernism. Well, there were as many modernisms as there were modernists. Mm -hmm. But Loisy received Newman in a, in a, in a certain way. Uh, Turrell, in, his, in a certain phase of his own thinking, received Newman. Uh, later on, he turned against him at an even more problematic stage. There were others. Um, this is possible because of a select reading and because Newman indeed paid attention to the inner dynamics of history. Though his understanding of history was always all the way down theological, mm -hmm. in a profoundly Augustinian sense. And that is a moment that was not appreciated sufficiently and captured by some of the liberal um, Catholics who would project on the Newman their own uh, modern historicist understanding. And Newman was very clearly not a historicist. That's quite obvious if one gives his book, Development of Doctrine, a careful reading. There is no historicism whatsoever in that book. Mm -hmm. And historicity as a comprehensive framework in the modern sense is not something that Newman embraced. Mm -hmm. Now, some of Newman's students and friends, like you referred earlier to Alice, um, uh, would go other directions. Some of his students wanted to recapture a Catholic world that was integral, uh, uh, the unity of throne and altar, the Catholic kings let them have back. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so there was a, a romantic movement among students of Newman and of course others in the 19th and 20th century to recapture the situation before the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Newman was never in favor of that either. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, there were aspects of the Newman in the Oxford movement where he was politically conservative, uh, that's true, that changed later as a, as a Catholic, he was not in the same way a political Tory conservative, I uh, would say, uh, anymore who, who was interested in the, in the, uh, the proper arrangement of the, of the Anglican Church in England, that was a particular phase. Um, Newman definitely was not interested as a Catholic in the necessity of recapturing a particular configuration of cultural socio-political Catholicism, like some of his students. They would, and he would never uh, agree with that. He thought that was unnecessary for Catholicism per se and for the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church can live with many arrangements, including the fact that the Pope doesn't need papal states. That was very controversial. The ultramontanists wanted to hold on to that. Newman saw no necessity that as an intrinsic <laughs> component of the papacy as a proper spiritual office that the papal states should be needed. And so he was in that sense not a traditionalist. He was not a, uh, 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 he was definitely not an ultramontanist in the 19th century sense. Um, but certain aspects of his thought, namely his clear outspokenness against theological liberalism, uh, was captured by people, and, and they thought he, uh, this was compatible with a comprehensive traditionalism. Mm -hmm. His opposition to liberalism in theology meant uh, an opposition to rationalism taking over in theology, to reduce the reality of the supernatural to what can be understood, and that and liberalism often combined that in theology with a moral optimism, what maybe the present Pope, Pope Francis, would call neo-Pelagianism, uh, hmm. um, an optimism in human uh, nature and the improvability of the human lot simply by based on, uh, based on reason and uh, 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 socio-political strategies. Newman was always suspicious of that because of his uh, fundamental uh, understanding of the nature of original sin and uh, the deep uh, wounds uh, that original sin caused. Um, yeah, you see that Augustinian um, part of him kind of coming out. And uh, actually, kind of in that light, it's, it might be good to see his contribution to Vatican II because you see, um, there's a lot of talk of how to, you know, receiving the documents of Vatican II, especially one of the most controversial uh, ones, namely uh, Dignitatis Humanum, 
And in your book, you do a great job of kind of showing how um, Newson's, New, New, uh, Newman's essay in the development of Christian doctrine and his, his notes um, apply to ex, um, how, showing how this, this document is not a rupture in the church's um, doctrine. So could you say a little bit about that and also um, the development of doctrine, especially those notes? Yeah, um, we, uh, we would have to say a few things. First of all, it is clear that Newman had uh, an influence mediated uh, especially uh, by way of Yves Congar, mm -hmm. uh, the famous French Dominican who um, uh, had a considerable influence at the council. Uh, he was on various preparatory commissions uh, uh, and, and drafting uh, committees. And uh, Congar himself received Newman's work on the development of doctrine in a deep and intense way. Um, and so we, we, there were also other influences, of course, by way of um, um, Josef Ratzinger, who had an influence on the council. Newman had a deep influence on Ratzinger. We could also identify a number of other theologians. So this is kind of the impact of Newman through those key figures, theological key figures at the council. The documents, uh, I think uh, uh, you can find echoes in Dei Verbum on divine revelation in the section um, on the development of doctrine there. It's a brief section, but the way it's articulated, you can definitely find uh, echoes in the influence of Newman there. Uh, in Lumen Gentium, um, the chapter on the lady, um, and and uh, that, that's very important uh, who who they are um, and, uh, and and, and uh, how that chapter is correlated to the people of God and here you see uh, key aspects of Newman's ecclesiology and in Gaudium et Spes the whole uh, teaching on conscience in Gaudium et Spes mm -hmm. is deeply influenced. Uh, by Newman. And Gaudium et Spes is, of course, in a way deeply con connected with Dignitatis Humanae. Dignitatis mm -hmm. Humanae, can say, is a certain application of key principles of Gaudium et Spes. Um, and in there, you find, <clears throat> you find also aspects uh, of Newman's thought on conscience at play. Um, and, of course, Dignitatis Humanae and Gaudium et Spes are best interpreted in light of Newman's teaching on conscience. Mm -hmm. We have very much these days a counterfeit of conscience at play yes. in, uh, in the wider society and also in the Catholic Church, where private judgment, namely uh, the self-will, my own uh, willing, my own arbitrary or uh, willing guided by my own desires, is declared as conscience. And that is a typical counterfeit. A label of something else is claimed for a dynamic that is actually very different from conscience. Mm -hmm. And so Newman's own teaching on conscience, conscience being the echo of the voice of God, um, conscience directing us back to God, to God's law, um, is uh, uh, important to understand Gaudium et Spes rightly. The dignity of conscience in Gaudium et Spes is the dignity of the root of human conscience, not that it's my own decision. That's not the dignity in human conscience. The dignity is that it is the echo of the voice of God that is implanted in me. So uh, that's just on that. Uh, I, ha I think I have not addressed another part of your question. You were, um, you were but it was about, on dignitatis humanum, especially you, you see some people um, reading it as advocating this kind of liberal uh, freedom that's detached from the truth. But then you have that, that clause in there about the duty of seeking the truth, especially religious truth. So kind of reading conscience in the light of, of, of truth and freedom and truth is, is so needed today. Um, so, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And there you see the convergence of Newman's teaching on conscience with Veritatis Splendor, mm -hmm. with Thomas Aquinas' teaching on conscience. Um, and that is uh, 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 what we might uh, call um, the uh, continuity of principles is one of the notes of Newman's development of doctrine, a continuity of principles and um, 
uh, these uh, fundamental principles uh, that are given to us um, cannot be um, simply uh, put to the side. Um, other notes that are very important that people tend to forget when they uh, especially uh, are eager to, to justify ruptures in the development of the church's doctrine um, is the um, conservative action on the past. This is maybe one of the most important um, notes because for Newman, um, development is a given of historical existence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, big ideas that have an impact on the human mind uh, continue to work on the human mind, also the collective mind. And so development is not the question. The question is what is authentic development mm -hmm. of doctrine. And in that sense, uh, um, the, the, uh, um, the, the, the notion of conservative action on its own past uh, and that there's a logical sequence in the development is key for guaranteeing that it is actually a um, authentic development and not a corruption uh, of uh, doctrine. I should also add one more thing. People tend to forget that when they, many people these days, when they read the development of doctrine, Newman has a very broad concept of doctrine at play in that work because mm -hmm. of his Anglican audience. He wanted to convince his Anglican audience that what Anglicans would consider corruptions in the Catholic Church, corruptions that set in after after the fifth century, after Chalcedon, uh, roughly, um, pertaining to uh, Marian uh, devotion, pertaining to many other practices, the, the veneration of the saints, and so on and so forth, uh, that these things were all corruptions, and he wanted to uh, defend them and show that they were all that they can be read as authentic developments. But he saw them all encompassed by this broad notion of doctrine. Yes. yes. Um, this is different from a Catholic consideration of what we might call the development or the evolution of dogma. Dogma, in the much more precise sense, of irreversible teachings. Okay. Uh, definitive teachings, as we say now, um, and uh, Newman had them also in view, but not exclusively. Okay. A much broader argument in view in relationship to a Protestant audience, and that's important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So, so for for example, I mean, um, sometimes there are things that that Jesus says within the Gospels that seems to be clearly stated, and the church has consistently throughout the ages taught that. Um, and so it's not like, you know, in the name of something else, maybe the zeitgeist or the situation of the time, we can then change that teaching or allow an ambiguity that will uh, then say, well, this is an authentic development. Newman would possibly see that as a corruption. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, that is correct. One would have the, 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 the onus the onus or the burden of the proof that this is an authentic correction, uh, something that uh, contradicts the words of the gospel or a clear saying of the gospel in the opposite sense, mm -hmm. and also contradicts the church's reception of mm -hmm. this passage of scripture over the centuries. The burden of the proof that this is supposedly an authentic development is precisely on the people who make that claim. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, they need to be able to show that, and if they cannot, uh, uh, there, there, there is no there is no authentic development there. There is wishful thinking there mm -hmm. uh, uh, of wanting to have something else, uh, but no authentic development. In other words, going around and using the word development as a synonym uh, for a rupture or for revolution is uh, is again uh, uh, creating a counterfeit. Yes, uh, yes. In other words, we, we, we might want ruptures, we might want a revolution of doctrine in the broadest sense, we might want to have a radical rethinking of doctrine in light of a new norm, namely the spirit of the age, or alleged new demands on the church from the seculum, the secular age, um, and we simply call it developments. Um, this is a counterfeit. Uh, because the word development has become accepted in the course of the 20th century, 
So let's just claim the word, call it development, though it is something else. According to Newman's uh, criteria, uh, that would be a counterfeit. Uh, and a counterfeit stands always in danger of producing uh, a corruption of doctor. Now, now, your book on um, just on, on truth and its counterfeits, um, I've oftentimes associated Newman with what, what you call its counterfeit, uh, counterfeit, namely um, thinking about faith in terms of private judgment. I thought your chapter on, on, on Newman's um, understanding of faith and, and necessarily tending towards joining the church and linking the two of them together is just so, so important today. So, um, Newman. Yeah, maybe, is, maybe it is indeed the case that Newman's thoughts on faith are the least appreciated these days. Mm -hmm. I think people who want to encounter them need to go to his uh, discourses uh, for mixed congregations and to his difficult late work. The grammar of assent. Okay. Uh, 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 it's a demanding work, but a very important work that one should not forget. Uh, those two works, and the reminder of the fact that the church is celebrating uh, now the feast of Saint John Henry Newman on the day of his conversion, mm. and not on the day of his death. I think this is an important judgment of the church to acknowledge that uh, entering into full communion with the Catholic Church based on the faith, on the fullness of the Catholic faith, is indispensable and significant, even in the middle of an ecumenical age, mm -hmm. and is not dispensed with by a progress through or alleged progress in ecumenical conversations. Uh, Newman's fundamental understanding uh, then the act of faith is made in its full sense, with its full implications, that act um, leads one, brings one to, a, to the Catholic Church and uh, entails eventually in its full flourishing, entering into communion and being in communion with the Catholic Church. That becomes very clear in, a, in, in a, his discourse on faith and private judgment. In the mixed discourse, is a very important discourse, a bit of countercultural against the spirit of the age <laughs> these days, provocative discourse. As many of his sermons would actually be provocative these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and Newman is New, Newman uh, was able to swim upstream. Uh, he had the strength to go upstream in many ways. Also in his thinking about the university, I should add, he's swimming upstream. I was going to ask you about that because uh, many of our followers are actually um, involved in education, either at the high school level, sometimes at the college university level. And his lectures on the idea of the university um, is so important today. Can you say some things about like the nature of um, or what the university is today, as you've experienced it, and how we, what we can learn from Newman. That's a long story. I don't know I'm how to say. take that into into a I, few uh, uh, into a few considerations. I mean, let me first of all say something um, about Newman's vision. Newman wanted to recapture the integrity of education. Uh, in his idea of the university. And a university, according to his mind, is a place in which the unity of truth, um, expansive in its universality, is being taught across a range of disciplines that are seen as interconnected and correlated. And students who are exposed to that um, receive a cultivation of their mind in a way that they can uh, enter the world um, in a balanced, considered way, um, knowing what they know, also knowing what they don't know or where they know fewer things. They can read the world in its interconnectedness and comprehensiveness. At the same time, he wanted uh, uh, these human beings to be morally formed, um, to become not just brains 
on legs, but people, as C.S. Lewis would say, with chests, uh, persons with um, holy hearts, um, strong virtues. And Newman knew that the university, qua university, even the best kind of university, according to his own idea, cannot deliver that on its own. Mm -hmm. For that, the university needs the presence of the church in the university, not above the university, but present in the university through um, the professors who themselves ideally are practicing Christians in his understanding, Catholics, uh, who um, the presence of campus ministers, and the presence especially of tutors, mm -hmm. persons close to the students um, who would tutor them spiritually and intellectually, individually or in small groups, and that these tutors would live with them and the students would encounter tutors and professors from different disciplines and students from different disciplines together uh, in a life form around a shared table in which one would have free conversations about all subject matters and that that was a crucial component for the formation of the mind um, of students and of their character morally. Hmm. Um, and just by describing that now to you, you realize how far away from that our contempt many most our contemporary universities are. Mm -hmm. Um, how our universities have been transformed to various degrees, some more than others, into what I call a polytechnicum. Uh, actually, Newman himself uses uh, a similar word in, uh, in uh, one of his university uh, lectures. He refers to Bacon, the Baconian University. Um, the, it's the University of Utility, the university whose purpose it is primarily uh, to equip people with skills to solve problems in the world. The real and world, right? <laughs> the so-called real world, yes. Yeah. And that means um, that uh, education has become instrumentalized, also higher education has become instrumentalized. Its purpose is extrinsic, outward geared, toward utility. Now, Newman is not despising that completely. He says uh, uh, the Baconian University can deliver certain goods, of course, and it does. Um, but at the same time, it makes the higher goal uh, impossible. It blocks it out. The mm -hmm. higher goal is the cultivation of the mind for its own sake. Now, according to Newman, there is a remote utility involved in that, in the cultivation of the mind. Namely, that the person who has a cultivated mind and the properly formed character, that's the work of the church in the <laughs> university, will uh, be able to operate very successfully in many settings <laughs> after her or his university days are over and maybe re at that time receive professional training in a medical school or a law school. Uh, or uh, a school of engineering or uh, whatever, but precisely based on the formation that primarily takes place in the undergraduate setting, in Newman's idea, will be able to be of great service in all of these settings, even uh, Newman assumed of greater service than a person who is immediately trained just for practical purposes. <laughs> Yes, I see, having a little experience in the high schools, I see uh, students are, are longing for this kind of unified curriculum that uh, Newman presents because it's just the inner dynamics of the mind, they're just, you're always seeking those first principles. And um, it's... And Newman, uh, uh, what is important is that Newman uh, in the university also thought that the issue is not simply conveying knowledge, but the way we think about it, mm. coming to own it, mm. coming coming to, to penetrate it. So, so reflection on knowledge was for Newman in some ways more important than just receiving the knowledge. So mm. it was not learning in the sense of cramming, learning by heart, but being an active recipient um, with a reflective mind that is able to sort out, to classify, to increasingly make mature judgments about the things one learns, 
about the reliability of the sources one learns, about other views besides one's own view on things, and how one can enter into a uh, meaningful um, and intelligent dialogue also with people who disagree with us. Mm -hmm. That was very important for Newman's University, to learn the art of dialogue, respectful dialogue, um, on a high level in complex situations in which one cannot form a quick opinion about everything. Something he didn't like was viewiness that we have all over these days. People form a view, uh, a shallow opinion in half a second based on a few blogs they read, mm -hmm. and that's that. Then they have formed their opinion on something. Yeah, and Again. it's just the sake of argument is to win. Um, the sake of argument is to win, and, and uh, the, the begging is often shallow, and Newman's university education is meant to overcome that, yes. to help the formation of a person intellectually and morally, so that the person later on, many years after the university education is over, is able to continue that way of learning um, as if she or he were still in the university, acquiring new languages, acquiring new insights in areas one has never encountered and connecting them with the areas one is familiar with and has competency in, and going to similar processes. This is the remote utility of Newman's, let's say, humanistic education. Mm -hmm. When you have been shaped and formed by it once, you can always carry it on on your own long after you have left the university. Well, in order to do that, I encourage all everybody who's listening to go and and read Newman, especially his essay on the doctrine of, on the development of doctrine, the grammar of assent. You'll see exactly what Dr. Hooter is talking about and how to kind of the the process by which we reason um, laid out, and then especially the idea of the university. And then in February, uh, Dr. Hooter's book. Uh, John Henry Newman on Truth and Its Counterfeits, A Guide for Our Times, will come out. And I encourage you to pre-order that now. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Hooter. It was great to have you on. And um, I mean, it's, uh, it, we hope that uh, we have you on again um, to talk about possibly Newman again or Thomas Aquinas. So we thank you so much for your time. It would be a great pleasure. Thank you so much.